most of the content that I produce is philosophic in nature, or we're talking about uh, uh, how to live a better life, and, and I'm talking about you know kind of how to how to be a better human being, how to think, logic, reason, things social, and this is you know kind of related, but. I've had some experience in the domestic violence, family violence arena, and wanted to share it with you. So, so first, briefly, my experience, the, the reason that I think I'm qualified to ask for a little bit of your time, if this is something of interest to you. So we'll start out in my childhood. Uh, when I was about four years old, my mother was rearing me. There was never a, a, a dad in the picture. And as she reared me, I think through birth, through my whole life, she dated two guys. One of them was Adam Turtle, and this one uh, was when I was about four years old. We were living way back in the hills of Tennessee, and uh, he was a farmer, and, and, and I think they dated for some months. But at the time that they broke up, I remember it was a, a rainy night, and I was four years old, and somebody was there to take my mom and me uh, away from his farm. And we didn't live with him, but we would do overnights there. And we were standing out in the driveway area, and they were arguing, and she was telling them they were done. And I recall, my little four-year-old brain, this is imprinted, he grabs her by the hair and kind of yanks, throws her down onto the muddy ground. And that, I didn't like that. That that bugged me a good bit. So I think that kind of had a little bit of an effect on uh, my worldview for the rest of my life. And then a few years after that, I don't know, I was six, seven, eight years old, something like that, and we were living in Grimsley, Tennessee, and we were visiting some friends, and I looked across the field, uh, you know, I'm guessing 100, 200 yards away at the neighbor's house, and the guy was beating his wife, big hillbilly, huge guy, and he was hitting her and, and, and punching her, uh, throwing her down, throwing her on the hood of the car, that kind of thing. Brought a shotgun out and was pointing it at her, yelling, threatening her. And the woman who we were visiting said, yeah, that, that happens a bunch. And she grabbed her pistol and had it there just in case he decided for some reason to come over to, to her house. And uh, I'm sure we called the cops. Um, but, yeah, that doesn't do much. So. So that was my second experience in domestic violence, family violence. And years later, I decided to become a police officer. I was a police officer for about uh, just a little under 10 years. And so I, I went to many, many family violence uh, calls. And then I was a crimes against children detective as part of my, my time as a police officer. And uh, so I, I dealt with a lot of family interactions there. Um, I've been married for almost 20 years. Uh, fortunately, that is, I'm, I'm using that as a, uh, a thing to talk about my experience. Not that I abuse my wife or that she abuses me, uh, but that I, I know some about marital relationships. And I, and I think that's important. I recall as a young cop going to calls before I was married or had had a long-term live-in girlfriend. And I, I, there's just certain things you don't know until you've been in a situation, and marriage is, is one of those things. So I do have experience in marriage. Uh, I don't have experience of violence in a marriage, and that's been wonderful. Other areas of experience, I have an undergraduate degree in social science, I believe. Um, I believe that's what it's in. I don't know. It's college. <laughs> what a waste. Um, but more importantly, I, I've studied violence a lot. I've studied uh, human interactions that's kind of been a, a very important part of my life, in part because uh, for over 20 years, I guess close to 30 years, I've had an interest in executive protection, bodyguarding, security consultation. So I've, I've taken a lot of classes in that uh, arena. I have had a company for many years providing those services, uh, private investigations as well. But mainly my focus now, uh, I don't really do any bodyguarding anymore. Uh, it's on security consultation. So when families, uh, and I kind of cater to families of high net worth, when there's an issue within the family that uh, uh, they're concerned about an outside threat or an internal threat, um, I kind of help them with the uh, risk analysis, uh, risk assessment, and then also with the risk management. Um, how do we keep the family safe uh, moving forward? And I also teach 
uh, women's self-defense classes. And I've done that for over 30 years. Uh, it's just been an area of interest. And uh, so that's something that I have, have focused on for a long time. Uh, so that is a bit about my background, my experience, and why I know a little bit about this. And so I, well, I say no. I'm going to share with you my perspectives. And I could certainly be wrong. Um, I don't think I am, but I, I could be wrong. So I'm hoping that the 30, well, I guess more than that, almost 50 years of experience that I have, uh, will I can condense it into less than an hour and help you so that you don't have to spend 50 years learning as much as, as I have. And please take everything I say with a grain of salt. There are going to be some generalizations. For example, um, I'm going to talk about him as the guy who is the aggressor. Well, that's not always the case. I'm going to trust you to have the intellectual capacity not to be that person who goes and leaves a comment below saying, well, you know, uh, sometimes women also beat men. Yes, I know that. Just we're talking about generalizations here. We're talking about 80-20, 90-10 rule kind of thing. So generally it is the guy that's the bad guy. He's the aggressor. So how much of this is going on? Don't know. I can tell you that the statistics that you hear are flawed. I, I don't trust them. Um, frequently, the number that we hear is one out of four women are abused at some point in their lives. Well, let's look at the definition of abused. And sometimes that is emotional abuse. And emotional abuse is bad. And I think there's a good argument that it is sometimes much worse than physical violence. However, what I'm talking about in this video is not emotional abuse. I'm talking about physical violence. I'm talking about somebody punching, strangling, pulling, throwing, threatening physical violence, uh, that kind of thing. That's what we're talking about here. And things get very cloudy when we try to include too many things under the family violence umbrella. And if somebody calls a woman a fat pig that is worthless, that's not nice of them, and that's bad, and maybe she shouldn't be in that relationship. But that's not violence, in my opinion. It's bad, but it's not what we're talking about in this video. What we're talking about in this video is touching in an angry, mean, bad way. And whether, again, that's pulling, strangling, choking, choking um, throwing on the ground, shouldering, elbowing, um, any of that, uh, I would consider to be physical violence. I would even go so far as to say that if, if a guy draws his fist back or he gets in her face like this and he's you know kind of meaning that he's you know getting ready to head butter or something like that, I'll even say that the threat of violence, we can we can include that um, in what we're talking about today. Um, so the statistics, I don't know what the numbers are. I'm gonna say somewhere between 20%, uh, I, I would even go lower. I'd say between 10% and 30% of women at some point in their life will have some boyfriend or some husband use physical violence against them. Now, I'm including a boyfriend who one time shoves them against the wall, and then she leaves him, and that was at age 17, and it never happens to her again. But she did experience it once in her life. What I am more interested in is the person who is consistently living in this way, the, the woman who is stuck in a relationship and is constantly being beaten and threatened and thrown down and strangled and is living this horrible life. That's, that's more my area of interest in what this, this video is about. Now, like child abusers, politicians, etc., wife beaters, domestic abusers are frequently very personable, likable people. That's what you do if you don't want to get in trouble, is you're likable and you find ways to get out of trouble. And so for the true predator guy who wants to beat and control, physically control his woman and have a, a long relationship where she is essentially his slave, obedient to him, does what he says, no back talking, dinner's on the table at five, and he just wants to feel that power. For that bad guy, it's going to be important to him to develop some skills in not getting in trouble. And 
So you're generally, if you don't know what's happening inside the walls of a home, you're going to think that the guy is the nicest guy in the world. And even as a trained police officer, I remember one of my first, I'd been a cop for a few years, but only on the street. I worked in a jail, a big medium security jail for a few years, or a couple of years. And then I went out onto the street and I was in a beach town in Southern California. And I recall going to a call and it was a bouncer that I knew from a, a bar in that town uh, from, through police work. I'd seen him before. And he's probably six foot six, really buffed. And his little girlfriend was crying and being a jerk and just meh, 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 just yipping, yapping at him, at the cops. And he was just being so nice. Like, what a nice guy. He said, hey, guys, I'm so sorry y'all had to come out here. And she's just, she's been drinking, and, you know, and I'm so sorry she's acting this way. And I'm trying to calm her down. And she's, she's just she's out of control and I, I shouldn't let her drink this much. And, and I'm sorry, but you know, we'll, we'll try to keep the noise down. And, and, and I'm completely buying it. I'm just this gullible new cop kid on the street. Go, oh, okay. Well, that's good. And I, you know, I take the notes and I get her side of the story and I get his and I'm like, wow, how does he deal with her? Holy cow. What a nice guy. And then we walk outside and my training officer's like, you don't really believe him, do you? I'm like, what do you mean? And he explained, no, they're, the, the bad guy is always going to act nice. He's going to try to befriend the police officer. We know the whole uh, men are from Mars, women are from Venus uh, book. If you haven't read that, please do. Uh, but we communicate in different ways. The, the two genders communicate in different ways. And yeah, I'm making this in 2021 and I happen to think there are two genders. But anyway, the the people who are born with that thing and the people that are born with the other thing, they don't communicate the same. And so who is going to be the cop? Most likely. Generalizing. It's probably going to be a guy, right? And so who's the perpetrator going to be? Probably a guy. So who is going to communicate in more of the in a more similar fashion? And the guy is being likable, charismatic, communicating in the way that the cop understands. And very frequently, the cop will go, yeah, you know, I don't think anything violent happened. And he interviews the gal right in front of the guy. Of course, he's mean facing her with the cop can't see this. She knows that she can't say anything or the guy will beat her more when the cops leave. And so there's this whole dynamic that I didn't realize existed until I had some experience. The guy is going to try to be likable. He's going to try to be approachable. You're going to be thinking, I was thinking... Um, in multiple calls that I went to. How's this guy put up with his gal? Why didn't he leave her? She's just this hysterical, emotional, mean person. How does he put up with her? And he's always calm. Yeah, sorry, officer, that you had to come out. It was noisy. I'll admit it. We're so, you know, I'm so sorry. And that was just a very common thing. So that's something that if you haven't been around it much, um, kind of watch out for that because you're going to come across family violence in your life. You're going to have a friend who experiences it, talks to you about it. You're going to see it. You're going to somehow, it'll come into your life. So I'm hoping what I've said so far and what I'm going to say are going to be kind of some tips that will help you go, oh, yeah, yeah, I might remember something like that. And before we move on, if you ask a domestic abuser's best friend, the guy who he works with and goes out for beers with afterward. If you say, hey, old, old Bill there, do you think he beats his wife? He'd say, oh, he would never do such a thing. He's way too nice of a guy like that. No, 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 he wouldn't do that. And if you ask the guy's minister and you ask his neighbor, oh, no, he's a great guy. That's going to be the general uh, thought. So next thing we're going to chat about is, and, and I don't have an answer to this. I'm going to give you my opinion, but it's kind of for you to think about. And you come to your conclusion. It, you know, there are a lot of people that say, well, child abusers or, or child molesters are not fixable. And wife beaters are the same. They're just, politicians are the same. If you're used to, you know, living off of stolen money and telling people what to do. You can never go back to being a productive human being. You're not fixable. I don't know. I don't know if a family violence uh, abuser is fixable or not. I am an optimist. I like human beings. I think people are generally good. And I think a lot of people are fixable. Now, what do they say? Something like 4% are sociopaths, psychopaths. And then I'll even expand that to say 90, 95% of people, I think, are fixable. 
from whatever issue they have that they're being bad, they're doing some bad actions at some point in their life, I think that they, they are fixable. Now, whether or not you have the patience or you want to help a person fix themselves, or certainly you don't have that obligation, but, but I think it's worth you thinking, are these people fixable? And if you come to the conclusion that people are fixable, that they are a human being, that at that point in their life, they're doing something bad, something wrong, something antisocial, they're not playing well with others, then what do we do? You want to fix them and make them a valuable member of society? Do you want to just punish them at great expense? What do you want to do? What do you think the best thing is? To, what's the best outcome from this bad situation? And so then on the other hand, if you think people are not fixable, any man that has ever shoved a woman, that guy is done for, um, he needs to be completely destroyed. And what the old warrior once tell me, the old, uh, anything, you put your hands together, and anything that will fit through that hole, you've got to destroy it. So when you go conquer a new land, um, and that includes kids and animals and buildings, you've got to completely destroy your enemy. Well, if you have that attitude about a guy who shoved a woman, then that's your perspective. And your perspective versus the person who says, hey, people are fixable. Let's get this guy to quit doing his bad thing. Let's encourage him, help him, whatever we can do so that he doesn't do this anymore. Um, you know, depending on your worldview, your preference, your perspective, I guess the outcome will be a little bit different depending on what you hold as a higher value. So something that I thought for half of my life, when I would see some a woman that was being consistently abused by her husband, I, I would just think, well, why didn't she leave? She knows this is going to happen. Why doesn't she just leave? And at my first half of my life, I didn't have quite complex enough of an understanding, or I didn't have an understanding of the complexities of life, and marriage, and relationships. And there's a lot that goes into a relationship. Those of you who have been in long-term relationships know this. There are relatives. There are, uh, you know, you, there are these situations where you really like the person's uncle or aunt, and you, you guys have formed a good relationship, and you like them, and, and maybe you even have a business relationship with them, or you borrowed money from them, and you owe them some money, um, or you borrowed a hundred bucks once, and you paid it right back, and now you have that bond. And there are pets that are jointly owned, and the house is jointly owned or rented, and the washing machine, and you really respect certain aspects of the other person in their relationship. So a guy who beats his wife might be the best dad in the world, like treats the children, or in many ways, treats the children wonderfully and teaches them and is patient, and he's great at fixing things around the house, and and he's helpful to neighbors, and he's generous and giving, and he's he's a uh, holds a leadership position at church, and he's just he's a good guy. Except that he beats his wife a few times a week. There are a lot of complexities, and it isn't as easy as just picking up and leaving. Now, I will say that it's as easy as that, perhaps, if it's a first time date. And the person is, you know, there's no commingling of assets or of lifestyles, friends, family members, neighbors, all that kind of stuff. Well, then it's, it's much easier. So kind of like many things in life, it's simple, but it's not easy. Yes, perhaps she should leave him. Depending on your worldview, perhaps he should fix himself. Perhaps neighbors and friends should help him fix himself. Or if you hold the more of a violent worldview, then the government should fix him. It depends on your worldview. But just recognize that it is complex, and it's not as easy for a couple that's been married for five years or 50 years. It's not as easy as just, oh, why don't you just leave it? Well, where is she going to sleep tonight? At the women's shelter? Well, what about tomorrow night? What about next month? What about the fact that they have both had their roles in their relationship for the last 20 years? And he has been the one that has made the money and invested the money. And all of those are accounts are in his name. And she has not. He has made sure of that. He has purposefully manipulated the relationship in such a way. And he's let her know. Because how much money do you have? Nothing. What are you going to do without me? 
you wouldn't know what to do. He has purposefully developed his career. He's able to go out and make more money. He's purposefully encouraged her, honey, you don't need to work. You don't know. You don't need to take that extra class in how to do Salesforce consulting. Um, you, you don't know. No, no, no. I'll take care of you. We, we, we've got this. You, you just keep taking care of the house and the children and I'll take care of bringing the money. Oh, okay, honey. Well, I, I do want to be a good wife and mother. Okay, I'll do that. And then 20 or 30 years later, she's way behind in the workforce, and uh, that's been her role. Well, what's she going to do? How's she going to go rent a place for two grand a month when she doesn't even have 500 or 1,000 bucks? Well, then she's going to have to fall into the system, the government system, um, to find a way out. And that is certainly not a good option in most cases. Sometimes it's better than continuing to get beaten until it gets progressively worse and he kills her someday. Definitely better than that. But it's certainly not a good option. It's not a, a it's not an efficient, effective, streamlined, good way to get out of a, a, an abusive relationship. So when I talk about the the government system, it's comprised of a of a number of, of different positions. People. There are the actual government positions, and then there are the people who have learned how to make money off of government laws and rules. So I'll kind of explain that. So the bottom line is you have the police officers. They are the people who are the first people to respond to when the neighbor calls and says, hey, hey, I hear yelling and some bottles breaking um, at, you know, one, two, three, corner walk and don't walk. And the cop is going to be the first person to show up and investigate the scene, write an initial report. Then that report is going to go to the police officer's corporal or sergeant. And that patrol sergeant will then go over the report and say, hey, this isn't clear, fix this. And then once it's a perfect report, then the sergeant approves it. And then it goes, depending on the, the size of the agency and the bureaucracy, it either goes one step higher and is reviewed, or it goes directly to the uh, county or city prosecuting attorney's office. And then the prosecutor, the clerk looks at it, assigns it to the proper attorney within that office. That attorney looks at it and says, hey, does one of the parties in this situation need to be prosecuted in a court? In court, Does the person need to go to jail or something like that? And then if they decide, yes, the person does, then they say, is this going to be a case that we can win? And if they look at the edit and they have this gut feeling that the guy is a bad guy and needs to go to jail, but they don't think it's a winnable case, then they're just going to drop it. They're not going to take it forward. Um, what is a prosecutor's job? Is it to find justice? Well, no, you don't get reelected if you have found justice. You get reelected because of your conviction rate. If you and your office are able to have a high conviction rate, then you get promoted within the office. And if you're the head, head dude or gal, then you get reelected. So the goal is to win cases, regardless of whether or not the person's guilty. Um, your goal is to win cases. And if it's not a winnable case, then you're not really going to waste your office's time on it. And you'll just, you know, let the, you're probably not even going to tell the police department. That initial cop who showed up at the scene is never going to know, most likely, what happened with the case, unless he's curious and follows up. Um, he'll never know what happened in the next step or the next step or the next step. So the prosecuting attorney gets it. Let's say that, that the prosecutor decides, hey, yeah, this case is worth doing. We can win this one. Then they are going to move it into the, the, court, the, the court system. So then there's a judge and a clerk and, of course, the security guys as you come in that do the metal detecting uh, to, to find out if anybody coming in is able to defend themselves. Anybody other than a, a government employee is able to defend themselves. There are those folks or the parking enforcement people that are writing the tickets to the people that have parked to come to the court. So there's this whole – the reason I'm mentioning all this, there's this whole system built around – I hate to call it criminal justice, but around the, the criminal prosecution um, area. There's this whole industry. And then in, in family violence, it goes beyond that. So once the person's in court, or even beforehand, they are referred to a usually a 501c3 or a, a subsection of the, the police or sheriff's department, or it's, it's quasi-government agency that is a, a women's family violence uh, network defense women's rights uh, defense type organization. And usually there are a few wealthy women that are helping fund it. And most of the funding comes from government grants, but there's also some 
private funding. And there will usually be some pretty rough, tough women with larger torsos and short hair and comfortable shoes that are in there that are just really kind of mean and, and bulldogish type gals that, that just hate all men and probably had a very bad experience earlier in life from, from a truly bad guy. There will be some people in there who were, I don't know, they have their degrees and their master's degrees and whatever counseling thing, but they weren't really able to make it in the, in the real world of free market counseling. So this was a kind of a quasi-government job. They were able to get a job as assistant associate to the administrative vice director of this <laughs> women's shelter with five people in it. And so they have this cool title and they're kind of a counselor and they go to all of these trainings where they're taught certain things, many of which are true, some of which are debatable. And this organization will typically, not everyone in it, not every organization, but it will typically have as its unwritten goal that the culture of the organization will be to destroy the man and to get the woman, and if she has children, to get them services. And they want to send them to counselors, and well, I guess that's the main thing. But they want to get them housing, and they want to get their life back on track. And almost more importantly, they want to destroy the man. The man is a piece of vomit, maggot, dirt, worthless, useless, no reason to try to get the family back together or make things work. The goal is to destroy the man, and not just during the court proceedings and until the separation divorce is complete, but for the rest of his life, to completely destroy him, not let him have a good relationship with his now ex-wife, with his children, etc. And again, this isn't all the time, but talk to somebody who you know who's been through a divorce and this group came into their life. The guy will definitely tell you that that's, that's what happened. Um, and he's not lying. He's, he's biased, um, but that is what frequently happens. They'll also, through the counseling and such, the victim will learn all kinds of psychobabble stuff and will be encouraged to identify herself not as a, a strong and powerful woman who is going to move forward in life, but to identify herself as a victim and to really think about her victimhood and to identify that, no, I am a victim. That's who I am as a person. And I was victimized. I'm a victim. I'm a victim. And that mentality is kind of ingrained in the woman. In, in many cases. Now, I've said a lot of negative stuff because overall, I don't like these organizations. They get a lot of their funding through money that's not acquired voluntarily, and they are not fair to all parties involved, and I don't, don't like that. I just generally don't like that. However, an organization, I think, even in a, in a proper good world without violence and coercion as we have in our current world, this type of organization would exist because they're going to be bad guys that hurt women. The women aren't going to have the resources to be able to help themselves. And there needs to be a group of people, an organization that steps in and helps women find their way out of bad relationships or helps them fix the relationship or whatever needs to happen. So kudos to the good hearted people who are trying to help and are not just the she woman, man haters, life destroyers, relationship destroyers that I have observed multiple, multiple times um, in my experience. There are also a lot of good people that have done good things um, in that industry. So also in that industry, uh, as part of the whole system that I'm discussing, there is a, an anger management consultant or not consultant, uh, counselor type of position. And this is again, a person who is probably didn't finish in the top half of their class, um, as is the case with over 50% of, well, about 50% of people from grad, that graduate from counseling or psychology uh, schools, uh, colleges, universities, 50% graduate in the bottom half of their class. So where do these people get jobs? Well, they're not going to be the one that goes out and starts a successful practice, probably. They're going to end up needing to work for a government organization. 
So, or a quasi-government organization. So those positions are all filled. And then there will be, you know, there's still some people who aren't that great at what they do. So then another place that they can go, and this is part of the system, is an anger management uh, counselor type of organization or individual practice. And this person will be on the approved list with a court. And that is something that the prosecutor and the Women's Defense Network will try to send uh, or force the man to go to these anger management classes. And probably the guy really needs some anger management counseling. Probably definitely be a good thing in his life. However, the type of the quality of services, the, the type of stuff that's taught, I just, my experience has been that it's low level, lousy, the guy doesn't really benefit from it 80% or more of the time. It's just, it's a, not a good thing. And here's something else I've noticed. These, these uh, uh, consultants or these, these counselors, that they have these classes. If they're a group class, they'll have them at 2 in the afternoon on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And that's when the guy will be assigned to go. Well, part of his frustration and stress in life is that he's not making enough money in his construction job or as an accountant or whatever. And so he needs his income. Well, his boss isn't going to let him take off an hour to drive, an hour in the, the counselor's office, and an hour to drive back every Tuesday and every Thursday. They're going to let him go. And I've seen this happen multiple times. It destroys the man's sense of, I'm a productive person in my career. And if your goal is to destroy a, a guy who did a bad thing, hey, we're winning there. Way to go. Um, you're destroying his life even further. Now he's not going to be able to make payments on his vehicle uh, or make the mortgage payments because he doesn't have that job. He's going to have a tough time finding another job when he says, well, no, I, have, I can't be there on Tuesdays and Thursdays between 1 and 4. Uh, he's not going to get hired for that. So there are a lot of problems within the system. And, of course, what's the government employee who sentenced him to it, the judge or the prosecutor who wanted him to go, well, that's his problem. He shouldn't have beaten her. Yeah, I agree. He should not have beaten her. And he's a bad dude. Bad things need to happen to him. But if we're, we're going to pretend, we can't even pretend that we're trying to fix all aspects of the situation if we're doing things that are probably going to destroy his life. I, I think that's fair to say. So then, what should a guy do? Let's just take a little break and talking about what, some of the observations. What would my advice be to, to, if you're watching this and you're a guy who sometimes just, you know, gets upset and shoves uh, his, his woman against the wall or, or grabs her and throws her onto the couch? And she, you never hurt her. You just you know, leave a little red mark around her wrist, but you're not really, you know, she just gets out of control and you've got to you got to kind of calm her down, shake her, and say, hey, quit being, a, you know, quit being this way. What would my advice to you be? Well, my advice would be knock it off. That is not an appropriate way to deal with other human beings. It's not appropriate to hit people or to physically assault them, to batter them, when you don't like something that they are doing. You should never initiate violence. No human being should ever initiate violence. And if you are initiating violence, knock that crap off. Just knock it off. And if you say that you can't help it because she just makes you crazy, well, don't be around her anymore. And I know it wouldn't be simple. It wouldn't be easy to break off the relationship. But if she is really, truly such a jerk and you don't like being around her, leave her. Walk away. Kick her out, depending on what the whole situation is. You guys are going to have to work that out between yourselves, and you're going to have to hire attorneys, and there's a whole industry built around that, and it's going to suck. But you fell for the whole idea of happily ever after, and you went and signed some contract saying that you're going to be with somebody regardless of how they act. You signed this contract, and it's and to infinity. Hey, you're the, you're the guy that did that. So now you're going to have to find a way to fix it. And it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be inexpensive. But don't freaking hurt her. Don't initiate violence against her. Walk away. Just walk away. 
And if you notice the warning signs, and I've had this in my life where I'm just under so much stress at work and other things, and I don't think I've been that frustrated with my wife, but there will be arguments. You'll be frustrated and everything will pile up. And you have that pencil and you just break it to release some of the stress. Is that healthy? And I've done that and I've thought about it. And I thought, what kind of habit do I want to get into? What habit do I want to have when I'm in a stressful situation? Do I want to put a, a pillow on a couch and beat it and, and have that be my stress release? And some psychologists will say, yes, no. I'm telling you, that's a bad idea. Don't get in the habit of developing that cycle, those, those steps. I'm angry. Now I'm going to be violent. No, that shouldn't be your go-to response when stuff's tough. Find some other thing. Go drink a glass of water every time you get angry. Go take a walk. Do something other than practicing violence. That's what I chose to do. That's not, that's not cool. Don't throw the cat against the wall. If you see yourself doing that kind of thing, holy cow, man, get out of that relationship. Whether temporarily or permanently, get yourself away. Knock that crap off. Um, it's not. It's not cool. It isn't cool. So, ladies, what should you do? What should you do if you are currently in a situation that you are being physically abused? Physical violence is being used against you. What should you do if you are, your mom's making you watch this, or your dad's making you watch this, and you're 13 years old, and they say, hey, this video, you know, you could experience this later in your life, and this is way more important than a full semester of your sophomore high school stuff, if you're going to a government school especially. If they're forcing you to watch this, whatever your search, uh, situation is, what do you do? What's, what's the action step? What do you go out and do? Well, one thing is to learn a little bit about self-defense. And as I mentioned earlier, I teach self-defense classes to women. But I've got, you let, let, got to let you in on a little secret. You being able to break a hold when a guy is holding your wrist and you're able to break out of it, that's a tiny percentage of what is important. Most of it is what is in your brain. And this is how you educate yourself. And this is how you develop this this, this identity that you say, I am not a victim. It's just, it's not a role I choose to take in life. Now, there will be times that for five minutes, I'll be a victim here and there in various things in life, but that's not who I am as a person. And when I'm victimized, I immediately get over it. I don't even really think about the word victim. Just something bad happened. Okay, now what are my smart, logical, reasonable steps to move out of this situation? Um, know what you'll tolerate. Know what you won't tolerate. Um, what happens if a boyfriend who you really like and you've been dating for three years and you're, well, let's say you're even fiancé to each other and he gets angry one night when you're out and grabs you by the wrist and pulls you out of the, the bar or the restaurant? What are you going to do? Is that something you're going to say, hey, don't you ever do that again? Or are you going to say, nope, this relationship's done? I don't, I'm not telling you which to do, but you've got to think about it. You've got to make these tough decisions. And I will tell you that there are plenty of guys out there, if you're interested in guys, there are plenty of guys out there who will not grab you by the wrist and pull you out of a bar, who will not slap you, who will not elbow you against the wall. There are a lot of good guys out there. They might not be as exciting as the, the rough, tough, bad guy. Um, they might not be as good at defending you <laughs> as the rough, tough, bad guy. But it's your choice. Who are you going to be with? Are you going to be with a nice guy who always finishes last? Or are you going to be with the rough, tough guy who nobody takes crap from? You know nobody other than him will ever hurt you because he's going to protect you. Is that really worth it? Is it really worth it if he's going to be shoving you around for your whole life? Is that how you want to live? So I guess what I'm saying is decide early in life what you will and won't tolerate. And that's a deal breaker. It's kind of easy if you, if you come across somebody like Jeffrey Dahmer and you're like, well... This guy molests kids, and then he kills them, and then he cooks them up in the, in the pot and puts them in the freezer and snacks on them later. Yeah, it's kind of a deal breaker. I think I probably won't stick with this guy because, eh, I'm not going to try to fix him. Well, that's kind of an extreme case. Decide what you're going to do if all the guy does is grab you by the hair and not 
in a fun sexual way, but it grabs you by the hair and shoves you to the ground once, do you want to stay in this relationship? Is this a good thing for you? Or is it a deal breaker, just like the Dahmer kind of dude? I don't know, tough decisions, but I suggest you make them before you end up in some relationship of this type. Make that decision ahead of time. Be mentally strong. This is a this is all of almost all about the mental game. If you don't have what it takes mentally to physically defend yourself, then there's no reason for you to go take a bunch of karate classes. You're probably smaller than the dude statistically. Chances are he can overpower you. So don't waste your time taking a series of six self defense classes from me. If you don't have the mental wherewithal to defend yourself, then why learn the skills that you're not going to be able to use? Now, if you're going to do something like that, take a class where the instructor, and this is what I do, focus a lot on the me uh, mental part of it. That's the important part. So make sure you have that squared away in your life, is that mental part. That's the big part. Um, and so that's, I guess, my advice to you. Now, if you are currently in a situation where you're being abused, I'm not telling you that there is a, a simple or an easy way out. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be tough. It's going to be horrible. And here I am, Mr. Nice Guy, and we have extra bedrooms in our house. Am I going to say, well, no, why don't you and your kids just move in for six months to our house? No, nope, I'm not offering that. And if I'm not, then who is? Well, there are government programs and systems and uh, help resources that they will try to get you into to help you. And maybe that's your best option at this point. Um, I, I think getting good advice and not touchy-feely, forgive me if you're a touchy-feely industry kind of person that yeah, I'm not, not trying to be mean here. I am kind of trying tough love. I'm going to say you're going to have to human up here. And you, you're in a bad situation, whether it's your fault or not, you're in a bad situation. What do you do now to get out of it? You're going to have to make money for the rest of your life. Are you able to make money as things currently stand? Well, if not, how do you develop yourself in a way that you can make money? How do you learn a basic skill? How do you, I mean, you can wait tables. You can learn how to do that on the job. Everybody in 2021, almost every single business in the United States is screaming and begging for employees. So if you have skills, you have a good, strong work ethic, you're willing to work, 40, 80 hours a week, there's a way out for you. Yep, it's going to be tougher if you have three kids that you're responsible for who you don't want to be with a guy, and you've got to find daycare for them that costs more than you'd be making. I don't know what your solution is. I don't claim to have the solution. That's a tough, tough situation that you're in. I'm sorry you are. Most of you watching this aren't in that situation. We kind of I'm not going to say we got lucky. We probably made some very different decisions, and luck played a role in it. But however it is, we're not in that situation now, and we should feel very fortunate and happy for ourselves. And maybe we should offer that gal who comes to us for some help, offer her a week in the spare in the guest room. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I definitely do that. I just don't want to have a, a live-in, move-in person, um, especially who's going to bring the drama. And, and let me tell you, there is a lot of drama involved in family violence. It's not just two engineer minded, engineering minded people logically having a disagreement and solving a problem and getting out of it. There's all kinds of drama. There are going to be late night phone calls and crying and honking outside and begging to come back. And after all you've done to help this person, they're going to go back to the guy. And you've done everything you can to help them counseled them, given them that spare room, you've given them money, you've helped them get a job, and then they go back with the dude. That's what happens over and over and over. And maybe it's the right thing. I'm not, I'm not, yeah, I'm kind of making a value judgment. I certainly have my bias there, but that's what happens many, 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 many times, high percentage of the time. He will talk her into it. I'm so sorry, honey. And Here's some flowers. Let's, there's a whole stage just like there are stages of uh, grief, loss. There are stages of a family violence breakup. And then he'll bring, afterwards, there's the honeymoon phase. He'll, he'll bring her flowers. And I'm so sorry, honey. And I was wrong. And I was out of control. And 
you know, it's it's the booze. I got to quit drinking the booze because when I drink, I just it make gets me angry and and, and, and I, you know I'm so sorry and, and please come back and I, I you know, love you and you know you really are pretty it, and then she's back and then of course alcohol doesn't turn you into a bad person it just accentuates the person that you are um, so if you're a mean person you can probably shield it mask it hide it fairly well until you get drunk and then the mask comes down and you're your real self you're a mean person um, that's what alcohol does and you know what since i bring up alcohol i didn't even have this in my my notes but i should have huge percentage of family violence cases alcohol was involved at least the ones that i worked as a cop and then when i did an internship with the county attorney's office uh, went through hundreds of cases and reading the case reports and almost all of them started with subject stated after having cocktails they returned to their home and booked there's all, almost always alcohol involved. So don't drink. Don't associate with those that drink. I say that. I had a beer last night. and Probably going to have one tonight. Your choice. But just know that if you choose a lifestyle of not drinking and not being around somebody who's drinking, eh, you've helped your probability. You've, you've helped your chances of not being that victim. So that's another little side note there. I'm going to do a follow-up video as I think of things. Uh, please leave comments below. I'm sure that I've forgotten things that are very important. Um, and I'll make a follow-up video, maybe even someday combine the two. Uh, but please do leave comments, things that I've missed, things that your experience has been different than mine, or your conclusions that you have drawn have been different than mine. Um, I look forward to hearing from you. And uh, For those of you in a tough situation, please reach out and find help from a friend. Uh, let me know. Email me. If you're in this bad situation, find a way to get help. I don't think you should live in that kind of situation. It's not healthy. It's not happy. It's not good for you. If you have kids, it's not good for them. It's not good for your dog to hear the yelling and the slamming of stuff. Don't don't live that life. Choose a different one. As difficult as is is going to be to get out of this horrible situation, gonna gonna be my advice that you, you need to take the steps necessary. Take that hard, rough weeks, months, years, dig yourself out of it, build yourself a wonderful life. Life should be good.